Yes, Yazid O'Neill is undoubtedly a dramatist with some extraordinary caliber that we do not find with many dramatists of the world. And Eugene O'Neill has produced this drama in 1922, just think of the period. It was produced immediately after the First World War. And after the First World War, the world was undergoing a very staunch economic collapse. Joblessness was a very visible global phenomenon of that time. People lost their jobs and they found that it was difficult for them to survive. And the First World War gave a very fatal lesson to the surviving generation. So what was that lesson? The lesson was that the human beings were yet to be civilized. That is before the First World War, by virtue of industrialization or by virtue of the development of science and technology, human beings started thinking that they tossed the genit of supremacy. They tossed the genit of civilization. But the First World War was a fatal blow on the prime vanity of human beings. The vanity that human beings have achieved supremacy over nature. But unfortunately, the First World War proved that human beings could not achieve supremacy over his own nature. So we have learned to exercise our power upon the surrounding nature. But unfortunately, we have lost the power upon our own human nature. So this very discovery was a fatal blow to the vanity and pride of human beings or human generations that survived after the First World War. So in such a very crucial period, in such a very precarious situation, while people were losing ideologies, while people were confused regarding uh, different axiomatic belief systems, in such a very period of loss of stability, loss of ideology, loss of belief, loss of pride, this drama was produced. This Haiti ape was produced in 1922. And just think of the Westland by T.S. Eliot. This drama, this poem was also produced in the same year. And what do you find in this poem? The reflection of hysteria of the modern people, the reflection of trauma of the modern people, the reflection of the loss of stability, sanctity of mind, and the reflection of man's confusion, very corrosive confusion, you will find in the Western. So this very text, the Haiti A, Regarding its tone or regarding its uh, message is very much close to the wasteland. Actually, in the capitalistic world, the crisis that haunts the working class people is about his own existence, about his own identity, about his own belonging. A working class person thinks or questions, to whom does he belong? Does he belong to the class 
whom he is serving? Or does he belong to the class in which he is living? Or does he belong to the whole world, which to a cosmopolitan is a place for all? So these are the questions that haunt the working class people, that visit the working class people frequently. And why do these questions visit us with a question? The questions tease us, the question haunt us because we find contrast between our belief and the reality. We are compelled to believe something in our way, but we find that very something in a different way, functioning it in a different way. So while we discover this contrast, we lose our faith, we lose our sense of belonging, and we are troubled by our identity crisis. You cannot explain all these things in a linear way, because these problems are not linear problems. Because these problems are very, very complicated and you have to approach these texts. That is the problems which form a text. You have to approach this text, not all the time logically, you may not be satisfied with your discovery by approaching these problems logically. Sometimes you, you, you may have approached these problems non-logically, not illogically, but non-logically, or sometimes illogically. There is the problems that you are facing are not always logical. For that reason, these problems deserve to be interpreted in a non-logical way or illogical way. Suppose you are the people of a democratic country. You are the people of a democratic country. You have the right to lead a safe and sound life. You have the fundamental right to move in this country freely. But sometimes your movement is restricted. You may fall victim to different uh, miscreants or different unexpected situations. Now you may question, why should I face these unexpected situations? I am a man or a woman of a democratic country, then why should I face these unexpected restrictions or restraints? You will not get the answers to these questions in a simple way, but you want to have the answers to these questions directly because you want to think about these problems from the perspective, from the political perspective available in your country or the political situations in which you are living. But unfortunately, you do not always get satisfactory answers to the questions. Then you have to approach these issues non-logical. You are a man of a free country, but you are not free. 
Are you free? No, you are not free. You are not free to say whatever you like. You are not free to do whatever you like. You are not free to go anywhere, wherever you want to go. But what does democracy say? Democracy says that you are free. But are you free in reality? No. This is called contrast. And while you face this contrast, you may suffer from a crisis. Who am I? To whom should I belong? Or do I belong to the society in which I live? Or does the society uh, accommodates, accommodate me? So this crowd of questions may visit you, but the answers to these questions are not always satisfactory. So while you are surrounded by all these questions, whose answers are not always available, you suffer from a crisis. And this crisis is called your identity crisis, the crisis of belonging. Okay. And this crisis is very intensified in the capitalistic society because society is a system which controls you. Society tells you that you are free. But at the same time, society controls you. Society imposes some rules and regulations on your movements, on your speech, on your thinking, on your way of thinking. This is called paradox. Paradox of our existence. Suppose if you go back to Darwin's origin of a species, the theory of evolution. What does Darwin say? Darwin says that human beings were at first, that is in predatory stage or primitive stage, human beings were apes. So apes are our cousins. Understand, apes are our cousins. Gorilla, chimpanzee. Chimpanzee is very close to human beings. And it is said that 98% uh, genetic structure goes with that of human beings. So chimpanzee is the nearest species of human beings. So we are cousins to uh, chimpanzees or apes. Now, Darwin has said that human beings started their journey from apes. And in course of time, through evolution, this does not happen overnight. It took millions of years. Okay, it, it, it took millions of years to, to, for human beings to evolutionize his appearance, his shape, his intelligence also. So we are now at the genit of evolution. That is, we are now standing at the place from which we look back and claim that we are the super creation. We are superior to all the human beings. We are superior to all other creatures. We are superior to apes. We are no more apes because apes go with primitivism, apes go with barbarity, apes go with crudeness, and human beings go with superiority, intelligence, civilization. So we are proud of this evolution. But very unfortunately, is this evolution mental and physical or only physical? It's a question. This question also tortures us. That are we, are we evolutionized only physically or intellectually or in our attitude? It's a very great question. 
the answer to this question is not easy because it requires a lot of investigation. The answer to this question, if we want to uh, give very directly and economically, frugally, then we may say that we are only physically evolutionized, but the instinct that we possessed during the primitive stage of human history is still living within us. We have failed to, to exile, to banish our this human instinct. So what's that instinct? The instinct of exploiting others, the instinct of oppressing others, the instinct of underestimating others, the instinct of stratification in the society and placing us selfishly on the upper uh, state of the society and considering the other people uh, living below our status as our servants. So these are the negative instincts which are still cherished and nourished in our mind. So human beings in the capitalistic society regarding their practices are now not progressing. They are regressing. They are regressing to the status of apes. We are not going forward. We are rather going backward. Backward to what? Backward to our kajins. Backward to the apes. Understand? And these apes are hairy apes. And for that reason, metaphorical in the character of young in this drama, you will find the reflection of this tendency. Why does Young go to the zoo? He goes to the zoo. This retreat to the zoo metaphorically interprets human beings backward movement. We are going back not regarding our multi-story buildings made of glasses or not regarding our bridges, gigantic bridges or metro rails or uh, uh, flyovers or other developments, not regarding all these infrastructural developments, but regarding our attitudes, regarding our tendency of exploiting others, regarding our instinct of sucking the blood of others, regarding our tendency of deceiving others and uh, dispossessing others. These are regarding all these things. Our movement is not towards civilization. Our movement is actually towards primitivism. So this backward movement of human beings regarding their uh, instinctive practices, regarding these practices. We are metaphorically like young are uh, going to the zoo that is going to our cousins. And at the end of this drama, you will find that young goes to the zoo and he teaches the gorilla which was confined in a case and in course of his, in course of his teasing or in course of his conversation with the gorilla, actually gorilla was not responding. It was just looking at him very minutely and young out of trance, it seems he was in hysteria. He entered into the zoo, that is the cage of gorilla and gorilla gave him a violent press against its bosom and young died. So why does young discover similarity with the gorilla? 
because he went to uh, WWI, that is the workers institution or organization, but the organization did not uh, accommodate him. And he discovered that he did not belong to that organization. The organization uh, whom he thought to be his own organization, the organization whom he thought to be congenial to him, to understand him. But unfortunately, that the organization did not respond to his ideas, respond to his uh, thoughts. And even in the road, he's not a proper match. He quarrels with the passersby. For that reason, he is to go to the prison house. That is, he was taken to custody, police custody. So does he belong to the road? No, he does not belong to the road. He does not belong to Manhattan, the very posh and aristocratic city. He does not belong to the uh, workers' organization. Then why should he go? Ultimately, he discovers that actually he belongs to nowhere. This is called identity crisis. For that reason, he discovers that man is not yet civilized. Man is to a man is still in his primitive status. So he has gone to the zoo in search of his cousin, and there he was killed by the embrace of a guru. So it's a very serious drama, and we have to study this text very critically from Marxist perspective, from political perspective, from social perspective, from economic perspective, and from psychological perspective. And technically, it's also a difficult drama. We have to know that in, uh, expressionism is applied in this text for narration. Okay. So I will discuss all these things in detail now. 